Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Unbuild It podcast. Today's podcast is sponsored by Huber Engineered Woods. Yes, they are the makers of Advantech and Zip System Solutions. Now, I could sit here and I could read all the metrics off of their website and tell you all the various products they have, sizes, R values, etc. But I'd rather tell you the things that you can't find on their website. I've been in the high performance home design business as an architect for close to 30 years. I've designed passive houses, zero energy houses, all along the spectrum of energy efficiency. And when it comes to looking for team players, I look for a company like Huber Engineered Woods. This is a company that, regardless of my technical question, my thoughts, my comments, they are always willing to listen. They are always willing to provide me with the best technical answer that they can provide. They are a true team player. And to be able to do what I do, I need to surround myself with manufacturers and companies just like Huber Engineered Woods. They've provided the development of products that continue to drive our industry, right? They came out with the original zip system and then they went one step above and they laminated rigid insulation to it and now we have the zip R system. So they just continue to push forward with innovative decisions and designs in their products. And I can only look forward to the next thing that they deliver. So I encourage you to look to Huber Engineered Woods for your sheathing solutions. Also sponsoring today's podcast is Sega. Sega is a leader in the development and production of high performance products, specifically the Myrex 200. Now, the Myrex 200 is a single directional vapor transport vapor retarder. I'm currently doing a project where the Seeger Myrex is actually an exceptional solution for my problems. Now, what may you ask is a single direction vapor transport? Well, it's a vapor retarder that is permeable from 0.16 to 1.3 perms towards the insulation, but should the wall assembly get wet, the permeance to dry out that wall assembly, the Myrex on the reverse side increases from 0.17 to 3.8 perms. So if you're looking for that airtight barrier to put on the inside of your insulation walls and provide exceptional vapor control, look no further than Sega's Myrex 200. So, onward to the podcast. Hope you enjoy it. This one's a treat. Thanks for listening. Take it away, Peter. Vapor. Yeah, I, I just told you I don't remember how to do the intro. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just part? see what you come up with yeah. then. You want me to do it? Maybe we'll I'll leave this I'll part in. You want me to do it? <laughs> sure. I don't care. All right. Give me two seconds. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's Jake, Peter, and Steve here on Build It Podcast. we got a good treat for you today. We talk about my least favorite topic, but I still get excited about it because I know these guys here are going to try and beat me up. They're going to try and overpower me, overwhelm me with their science, and make me say things that I don't really want to say, but... You know me, I stand tall and I put up a good fight. So, so wait, see, your least is... favorite topic? Are we talking about dachshunds? I didn't I didn't make notes. <laughs> well, I'm um, least favorite topic related to building science. Oh, well, okay. okay, so I really should have done the intro because the way I would have started Steve is vapor. It's a gas. See, that's exactly why you shouldn't be Come doing on, this. that was good. Yeah, that's you got a face for video uh, <coughs> audio. Good. Good, good, good. No, today we're, we're, we're talking all about vapor. What do we know about it? How does it work? What does it do for our buildings? How does it work against us? How does it work for us? What kind of products should we be concerned about using? What kind of products should we just basically be concerned about? And uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about it all. So 
Here we go. Who wants to start? Peter, why don't you give us your thoughts? What is vapor? Because it is such a gas. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we know the buildings get wet four ways, and it's bulk water, it's uh, wicking capillary, and then it's air leakage. And at the tail end, and I mean the tip of the tail, is vapor. So, yeah, it's a way that moisture moves in, on, and through buildings, but um, it's by far the weakest, and I, I mean way down in terms of how buildings get wet. Um, and, and, you know, the big thing in, to me is that um, the first two ways the buildings get wet are liquid, and that makes it way more scary. And then the other two are air leakage and vapor by diffusion. Well, that, that's both gases. And as Steve likes to say, I don't, I don't worry about the water when it's in vapor form. I worry about it condensing and getting to join the others with the liquid forms. How's that for a lead in for you, buddy? That, that sounds good. That sounds good. I mean, I, I want to say, you know, start out with, I don't give a damn about vapor. Um, but I, I won't say that. And I'll erase that because <laughs> comments like that come back to haunt you. <laughs> so, so I'm not I'm not going to say that. But but the bottom line is is my concern about vapor is one of the far least concerns of what's happening in a wall. And I say far least concerns because I take care of water and I take care of air first, and I like to think that I take care of those in a very good way. So as those heighten in um, performance, then I think the need for vapor performance diminishes. Does that sound? So, Peter, let, let's talk. We were just talking about one of the installation methods on a manufacturer's website for one of their smart vapor barriers. And you were telling me that there are two different installation methods do you want to walk me through that and why there would be two different installation methods because i think this is a really easy point to start with for vapor control yeah um so they're one of the quote-unquote smart vapor retarders and we'll have to loop back around for that topic um if it's being installed simply as a vapor retarder it has one set of installation instructions and then it clearly says, if you're using this as both a vapor retarder and an air control air, or more commonly sometimes called an air barrier, different set of instructions. And so, you know, okay, well, what's the difference? Well, when you put it up as a vapor retarder, you get to just put it up and not really seal it. You want continuous coverage, but you're not worried about where you penetrate it. You're not worrying about taping the seams. And then if you're doing it as an air control air and a vapor retarder, you have to be really careful and get all the seams sealed. So, okay, so why? Why is that? Why do we why do we have to be so careful with an air control layer for continuity, but not a vapor retarder? And so the answer is that vapor is pressure, right? So it's it's um, a field effect where it pushes equally on an entire surface or divider. I call right. that a uniform load. Ooh, I love that. A uniform load. Excellent. So Building science uh, calendar of the day, or word of the day calendar, that's what that is right there. See, see, a uniform load, that's like an overarching concept of how I give you crap. It's a uniform load. <laughs> yeah, I definitely as point, see it as pressure. A, yeah, a, yeah, as opposed I, to like a, a specific jab, that's a point load. So, Steve, I'm here trying to talk about science, and you've immediately turned it into it's all about you. And how no, I'm actually I've made it about you, but go ahead. There we go. Beat up on yeah, Steve Day. I think of you as a uniform load that I have to carry, frankly, every day, all the time. He Just ain't like heavy, he's my brother. <laughs> Jake, we're laughing because I used that expression on him about uh, two days ago. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it, it, if it's pressing equally everywhere and it's got 99% coverage, <clears throat> it's 99% effective. That's not how air leakage works. Air leakage is a highway. So literally, if you have a, a pathway, two holes and a driving force, literally, the molecules do run to that weak point. 
when we're talking about vapor pressure, they can't do that. They just push equally everywhere. They're stupid. They can't say, hey, there's a big hole over here. Let's all go there. Um, so I remember very clearly the day that Joe said, vapor pressure is a field effect. Air leakage is a point effect. You got to get everything right for the point effect. But if you have a one or five percent uh, lack of continuity with with a vapor retarder, it only drops by one to five percent effective. Um, and, and that's so, a huge deal. And so then, if we're using our air control layer as a vapor layer, and our air control layer is pretty darn good, then we've managed for vapor, right? Yeah. And the crazy thing is, and you know, we we often get accused, particularly Steve and I, of you know, cold climate northeast bias, um, and the 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 establishment of um, the fact that builders uh, buildings need an uh, an interior vapor retarder that was formulated in the 1930s and 40s for cold climates in Wisconsin, and we dragged that concept kicking and screaming across the United States where it's simply not climate appropriate. So, and here's the crazy thing is, we, we think that we can control vapor by a single layer, and that approach has gotten us into a lot of trouble. Steve, remember there was a period of time that we had high performance builders early on in the 2000s, maybe late 1990s, in uh, hot, uh, mixed humid climates like um, North Carolina, where the building inspector would say, you have to have six mil poly on the interior of the assembly. And so the builders would put it up and as soon as the inspector left, they would tear it down yeah. because it was inappropriate for the climate. Um, yeah, so we, we have a very painful long history of not understanding how vapor and its control is really climate tuned or should be. I spent a number of years putting poly on the inside of the walls when we were building houses in the late 90s and early 2000s we didn't know and i think that uh the only reason we didn't have big issues were we still had very leaky assemblies we still were using thermal and air movement to uh to dry out our assemblies we were doing a poor job installing that six mil poly yeah so my take on vapor diffusion is is i'm extremely marginally concerned about it but what i get more concerned about understanding vapor diffusion as a way to solve for my wall not as an enemy of my wall i don't know if that makes sense but it's it's i don't worry about vapor diffusion like oh my god my wall is going to get soaking wet i make i worry about vapor diffusion in a sense that if this got wet how does it dry out and so I kind of flipped the script on vapor diffusion in my wall assemblies and details to understand that. And I, and I think you're exactly right, Jake. When people talk about poly and this and that, I think the history of poly is, is that it really acted as a poor air barrier. And the backside of the wall was so damn forgiving that it really didn't create a problem. It was bad insulation that was mashed into, you know, the wall frame with some plywood back black paper and you know cedar siding on it so everything just kind of baked dry for a few months out of the year and maybe got wet a week or two out of the year and and that's which, the, yeah go ahead jake which that that concept is actually super important and peter and i were talking about that the other day that uh if something gets wet but it's able to dry and it dries before it's damaged, then does it matter at all? It did nothing. There, it was a wetting and drying cycle that didn't cause any damage. And without damage, we don't have an issue. Yeah, I like to say, you know, sometimes when I'm doing presentations, I'll say, well, if I didn't practice any of this crap called building science back when I was a builder, how come, you know, I, I do presentations across the country as opposed to having a criminal record, you know, for... Uh, the the damage I did on people's homes, and um, in eight years working full time. Wait, uh, you in, haven't changed your name, have you? Is that why? No. Okay. <laughs> so that was one of the solutions. Maybe we should do a last name change. But in 
eight years full time in Seacoast, New Hampshire, the number of projects that had central forest air conditioning that I worked on was one. So I'm convinced that my buildings were getting wet during the winter, but with no reverse vapor drive in the summer, that's when they were drying out. And in fact, there, there's been, I don't know, probably two dozen building investigations I've done where I've told the client, well, this assembly is wet now, but I really need to come back in September and find out if it's still wet then. And um, if, the, if the building gets wet, and by September it's dried out, you might be okay, right? Because a lot of building materials can get wet and if they dry out, that's great. It's when they stay wet that we might have the real problem. And you know, this, you know, the, the original code clearly said that a vapor retarder is one perm or less, right? And that's a huge range. And we didn't understand the impact of that um, when we when we uh, put up vapor retarders, and now we have three classes of vapor retarders. Um, is it too geeky to go into that? Sure. No, please no. overwhelm me. <laughs> um, well, the problem is that we shouldn't treat it as a uniform load, right, Steve? Yes. <laughs> right. So now we have three classes of vapor retarders. Uh, less than 0.1 perms is class one. 0.1 to 1 perms is class 2, and 1 to 10 perms is class 3, and anything above 10 perms is vapor open. And where did that come from? Like, what are the only two numerals in that whole scenario? Zeros and ones. And this is one of the things Steve and I loved about Joe was, okay, 6 mil poly is 0.06 perms. And Joe's like, no, it's not. It's just less than 0.1. Let's make everything multiples of 10, so it's easy to remember. So there's nothing magical about 0.1110. It's that it's easy to remember and their magnitude's different. Right. What, what if I called it the penny diamond dollar? Penny right. diamond yeah, dollar. Yeah, right? Penny's 0.01. Or it's 0.1, you said. Less than 0.1. That's a okay, penny. Okay, so it's dime. No. Point, yeah, no, 0.1 is a dime. 10 cents. I oh, you, I thought you said diamond. You said diamond. Oh, my dime. God. Oh. The, the order let's of magnitude say, argument works with penny diamond. What's a hearing aid website? I guess and at the Peter. I was just giving my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys could have seen the excitement that washed over Peter's face when he thought that joke up, you would be laughing as hard as we would. My oh. wife says, it's so sad. You, you so easily entertain yourself, Peter. Uh, I, I had uh, our editor, just so that our listeners know, say, uh, Jake, you, you laugh at your own jokes on the podcast. <laughs> and I said, yeah, <laughs> they amuse me. That's why I laugh at them. That's because somebody laugh at else them in real That's life, one too. of the things the three of us have in common is self-amusement. <laughs> I don't crack jokes. I try and maintain a certain level of seriousness here, but you guys tend to take it to the gutter. Just yeah. so, the you, so your lack of humor is another uniform load we have to deal exactly. with. Exactly. Thank you. So now that we, we understand vapor as a pressure and, and we understand kind of what the, what the code says about it, the, there's, there's a couple ways that I feel like every single person that I've ever heard speak about vapor talks about stopping it in your walls. And Steve mm -hmm. and I already pressed on one, which is the air leakage. So if I don't have any air leaking through my walls. I don't have any moist air leaking through my walls. And so that's a fantastic way to cut things down. The other one is exterior insulation that we always hear about. Mm. Would you like to explain, educate us on that, Professor Yost, on, on how, <laughs> why, why if I put more insulation on the outside of the wall, does that help? Yeah. Well, um, so that continuous insulation essentially warms everything to the interior. And if you make the uh, th make that space, the cavity, warmer, then vapor that does get into the assembly is much less likely to change from a vapor to a liquid. And that's because where we, of dew point. Because of dew point, and that's where we come up with the idea of a first condensing surface. And you know, this there's a lot of this that's um, interesting and also 
complicated that we need to simplify. But I remember John Straub saying, look, if you have an air permeable insulation like a fiberglass bat, it may reach the dew point temperature um, within the fiberglass bat, but that vapor is unlikely to accumulate until it gets to a continuous surface. It's like, what? It, you, you know, because if you do that, that profile of, you know, the arrow, the, 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 the temperature inside that cavity dropping, you know, one of my first reactions during one of Joe's presentations was, well, wait a minute, if it's dropping, it, it's reaching dew point in the middle of the fiberglass insulation. And the idea is that, um, and this gets sort of into film theory, that there are, that we, we like to think of things as very discrete. There's solids, liquids, and gases. And what film theory says is, yeah, if you have pores or very tiny spaces within a material, the molecules adhere to those and they may build up to like three to 10 molecules thick, but they're not completely acting like a liquid and they're not completely acting like a, 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 a gas. And so that's sort of what happens in the fiberglass insulation. They, they lose energy and they sort of accumulate on the surface of the fibers, but then they're not held there the same way as a phase change and they make their way. And then when they hit a solid surface, it's cold, that becomes the condensing surface. And it's just like a dehumidifier, right? Dehumidifier is a bunch of solid plates, right, that are surfaces. And we use that surface area to take the moisture out. You don't want to have a dehumidifier operating inside a closed cavity. So the discontinuous nature of fiberglass in insulation is is the reason, basically. Like, it, it, it's... That's what gives it its thermal is the void, and that's what keeps it from having things condense on it, most likely. Yeah, and, and whether those, you know, the, the way that we insulate is with tiny little pockets of air, and the if the pockets of air are discrete, right? You know, like in a spray foam, um, if 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 it's a if it's a closed cell spray foam, yeah, we we may have the same amount of air as we get in. Uh, say a fiberglass and, and we don't but as say cellulose but those air pockets are not discrete right they're not they're not forming a closed cell and so that's a huge difference because um you can have an open cell foam where um it acts as an air control layer because air doesn't move through it but it's still vapor permeable right but but the vapor is moving very slowly through that open cell closed foam compared to say an air permeable insulation like cellulose or or a fiberglass bat um and, and this gets back to the fact that if, if it's just vapor pressure that's working on that cavity insulation that that's incredibly different than if it's an air permeable insulation where it's like poop through a goose moving back and forth through that assembly um yeah, so we get we get this opportunity that if I warm the cavity, maybe I can put up a an interior vapor retarder, which is only there to manage diffusion and only diffusion that happens in the winter, right? Because it's the warm moist air inside trying to get into the cavity during the winter. So you 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 might not want that vapor retarder to be there the rest of the year. So it's this this is all driven by really cold climate. And the problem that we got issues with moisture condensing um, during that time of the year when we had warm moist air inside. Okay, so now we've cut down on our air leakage. We've warmed the interior of the wall, the cavity. And one that I feel like everybody glazes over or never discusses is dehumidification, which is something you brought up just now. Like, if we don't have super moist air on the inside of the house that limits the 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 initializing effect right that that cuts down on the possibility of all of this happening as well this makes me think about steve has this one of my favorite uh drawings of his where he's got the gears oh, of all the things up. that you can control wow um, you know what we should do we should use that uh, maybe even for this uh image for the podcast but yeah we you know the architect I'm stealing your thunder, Steve. That's you, right. Tell us about those wheels. No, no, and, go ahead. Uh, Knock it out, man. I, I want to hear why you love it so. <laughs> well, 
um, the wheels show that you can dial in different parts of performance. And if you're just using the enclosure to manage something like vapor, you're, you're missing the other opportunity, which is integrating your mechanicals with the performance of your enclosure. That to me is, is the way those dials. And I have this image in my mind of you sitting at your desk with like a curtain, like in The Wizard of Oz, and you're behind there as an architect, you know, moving these dials, you know, and you look a little bit crazy. And uh, yeah, it's how I envision you in your office behind the curtain. I like to see what goes on behind the curtain. For I will never, never, I will never show people what goes on behind the curtain. But you know, you 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 made some points before, Jake, that you know I highly value. There's, you know, we've sat in on other people giving lectures and they talk about moisture and this and that, and it forces me to raise my hand and say, well, where's all this mystery moisture you're talking about coming from? Right, because to have a moisture problem, I need a moisture load. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but you can't you can't just throw up moisture as this giant fear, right? Because if you have two thousand or two two people living in four thousand square foot house with no animals, and you know they, there's not a huge moisture load in there if it's properly tied to the mechanical system. Right. There's not a lot moving through the wall. And if you couple that with an air tightness on that house of, say, 1.0 or less, I have no driving force other than diffusion to move it into that wall. And if I have insulating sheathing on the outside of that wall, I've now warmed the cavity. And I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out a, a mystery one to you, Peter. And I, actually, I, I want to say you and Nathan visited this house hmm. but it's still somewhat of a mystery to me years ago about 10 years ago i would see probably even more than that now i did a house for a friend of mine he lives up in the hills of western mass i mean it's about 6900 heating degree days up there in the mountains mm -hmm. and it's uh probably i probably 3500 square foot house family of four nothing out of the normal um but when it came to insulating the roof, it was a cut roof, uh, two by tens. And I had suggested, you know, hit it with, a, a, he wanted to use spray foam. He had a friend that he's in the trades, he's an electrician. Yeah. And he wanted to use spray foam. And I said, well, I would hit it with three or four inches of closed cell and then follow up with isonine or the like open cell. And he didn't, he just blew open cell in there. And I said, oh man, we are, we are in for a treat here. Because there's there's a high potential that, you know, you're going to rot that sheathing. At least that's what a lot of people would say and believe. So what he did do is he allowed me every, every year we would go up there um, and cut some holes in that isonine. You know, maybe like an 8-inch diameter hole at different locations. And pull it out. That stuff yeah. was dry as a bone. Yeah. There well, was, there was um, no problems. I do remember going to that project with you, Steve, because th wasn't that the house that had pretty deep walls? And if the windows were small enough, yeah. those got the We did ICF through the first floor. Right, right. And then we did a second floor wood frame, and the whole second floor was the walls yeah. were wood frame. And I actually remember um, at Building Science Corporation, we, we someone cored a building that was in... Um, you know, closer to downtown Boston. Where was the other office they have besides Westford? Somerville. Somerville. I think I think they used open cell in the Somerville building, and when they cored to get to the sheathing, it was also dry. So here's here's what I think, which is, you manage the air, which is the most important way that they get wet, and then, and this is now reflected in recommendations that Building Science Corporation is making is, like if that's a a, basically a conditioned attic, right? Um, if you move air through that attic, and I think it's 50 CFM per 1,000 square feet is the recommendation. And we do. We have a couple drops up there. So the attic is treated like any other conditioned space. Right. So what that means is that um, we can get warm, moist air because it's more buoyant collecting at the peak of that uh, pitched roof. But if I circulate the air then we, we even out that uh, moisture content in the air 
Peter, in my building science world, we call that a microclimate. Oh. So there, <laughs> I feel like little grasshopper. The roles are reversed. <laughs> um, so if you move that air and you don't let the warm, moist air uh, sort of bubble at the peak, um, you know, it'd be really cool, Steve, to take a hobo data logger set it for reading once every half an hour hour that'll that means we can let it run for two years i bet you if we monitor the moisture uh temperature and relative humidity in the peak of that roof we're going to find that we're not getting that that bubble of uh higher vapor content air in in a building like that hey you brought up a good point because a lot of people recently we I saw a post, somebody posted something about how they monitor their walls and these thick insulated walls and they, they put all these sensors in there. And in the comments, they, they didn't respond to me, but I had asked, they said, did you put any hobos in the room? Mm. Right? Because the information in the wall mm. only really matters if we understand what the conditions are in the room. Yeah, my walls will really dry. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, nobody was in that room ever. It had dehumidification, yeah, it's unoccupied, and thirty percent RH year round in there. Okay. You know, Steve, I remember too. Relatively recently, I had a client who asked me about. Whoa, you know, we're building a an attached swimming pool, so the the pool is attached to the rest of the residence. And he said, "I'm I'm really concerned about how we're gonna, you know, detail the vapor retarder." And I said. You know, even before we start a conversation of the vapor retarder, you better have the best air control layer and a separate mechanical system for that space. So he went back to his boss and he said, well, this guy's saying before we worry about that vapor retarder, you know, we got to get a continuous air control air and a separate mechanical system. The guy said, a separate mechanical system? You have any idea how much that that's going to cost? And my attitude was, we well, probably should have figured that out before you. Yeah, well, you know, welcome to the world of owning an indoor pool. Yeah. And, but, but Steve, you have worked with a company that that's all they do. They are responsible for the performance of the attached swimming pool and they have kick-ass air sealing details. So, and, I, yeah, I'll, I'll give them a plug. They're called combined energy, as a matter of fact. So huh. they put, they, they take responsibility of the pool, the insulation and the HVAC. Now, the, the general contractor did some of the insulation, but mm -hmm. we, we collaborated on the efforts. And the final layer was, you know, to to them in, in rigid insulation. And and here's the crazy thing. It, the, the homeowner there, he, he uses it, the space as personal therapy. And he loves heat and humidity beyond... Um, human comfort levels wow. like i i can't if i go in that pool that pool house i can hang out in there for a couple minutes and then i have to leave yeah it's it's like running a marathon in guam you know <laughs> you can't breathe after the first couple minutes it's uh it's it's absolutely crazy but the place is performing exceptionally well and the other the other thing that for those of you that put the pool houses and all of that on there is when we did this, we actually built a vestibule between the house and the pool. So you basically go from house to a hallway that has doors on both sides, mm. then to the pool house. And the vestibule and the pool house are negative to the house. Right, right. So that we're always pulling away from the house. That, And, and it was really important in this because the pool house was a single story structure attached to a two and a half story structure. So even if, you know, we, 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 did, we just put it there, the stack effect would have been enough overwhelming pressure to try and suck that moisture into the house. And then we would have had serious problems because the house wasn't designed for that level of humidity. So there are special loads, you know, in, on, in particular spaces or buildings where, yeah, we do have to worry about vapor pressure. Like um, Jake. Yeah, so... Like one of my very first building investigations here in the Brattleboro area was uh, a home that um, after, fortunately for the builder, after it was built, they decided to attach about an 850 to 1,000 plant greenhouse to the building. And 
in the winter, they kept the door open between the greenhouse and the rest of the space, you know, to try to get some heat into that greenhouse in addition to the heater they had there. Well, that introduced a moisture load to the to the rest of the house that was very, very special. And they had they had very serious moisture problems. So if you have special loads, then there are instances where you do have to worry about vapor pressure. Um, but the, those are the exceptions, not the rule. I remember a study from Canada where they took a look at moisture problems in buildings and like less than 0.5% of the moisture issues were related to, to vapor drive. All the rest were bulk water leaks, air leakage, and wicking up through porous building materials. Um, Steve, I just had this image too of that you behind the curtain. And my question is, you know, like what would be the vapor permeability of that curtain? Was it, was it like a shower curtain, which is made out of vinyl? Concrete, iron, iron curtain. <laughs> An iron curtain. <laughs> okay, so we're continuing. <laughs> I'm trying to segue. Uh, so this, all of what we're talking about, it's such a small pressure. It's such a small volume. It, it can be very tiny. I think one of the important things that we point out is this uh, this volume of water is, is normally measured in grains. And yeah. we have to acknowledge how tiny a grain is. And a grain of water is one seven thousandth of a pint. So, like, we're talking about minuscule things, and it's still... I, I don't remember who it was that I was talking to. It may have been one of you guys uh, a, a few weeks ago when we were talking about vapor, and the conversation went to, yeah, it's, it's the least important out of everything we talk about. And yet, every time I go to a building science seminar, it's, uh, yeah, it, th this is the least important, and we're going to spend the next three hours talking about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we love to beat the hell out of vapor in, in chatter. And, well, and you know, in it, arguments, it's it, it's also cool for where that unit came from. It was a bunch of engineers, one grain moving through one square foot in one hour at one inch of mercury. And Joe loves that because it's all ones one, 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 one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when we um talk about that, you know, the vapor and how it's not important. I mean, I think the it's really important that if the assembly gets wet, the only way we can dry it is by diffusion. And so, you know, I have an article that I wrote on Green Building Advisor called the, uh, Doing a Vapor Profile, which means have you picked all the layers of your assembly so that if it does get wet, there's some directional drying. Um, so I, it's... I, yeah, th th this leads into something really cool that we can talk about here because this involves Jake and I, but Peter, this is just going to get you all hot and bothered. Um, so Jake and I are doing this building that he has under construction right now that I designed and Jake certainly collaborated on. But this is the one that I told you. We're actually attempting to do a 1 in 12 vented roof assembly. Mm. And, you know, with that, there's certainly concerns, right? Can Can we effectively vent it? And um, I think we can. We're building a double roof. So we're going to have a one and a half inch airspace outside the bottom sheathing. But it's also going to be vented along the soffit the whole way, all the way up the rake. So all three sides, it plugs into a high wall. So we only have three sides of venting available. And it's only 18 feet wide. So it, it's not very wide. But basically, you can vent all that. But like anything i know i said i don't worry about it that much but in this case i worry about it a little because the restrictions that this roof assembly is putting on us i want to make sure that we put as little moisture into that attic as possible so when i said i don't really worry about vapor i guess i wasn't a hundred percent truthful but in this particular, I think there's cases where you need to be concerned. If you if you design crazy, then you have to think on how to solve for crazy, right? Yeah. So with that, we're we're lining the whole ceiling with the Sega Myrex product, Smart Vapor Retarder. So not only do we have enhanced ventilation in this roof and a whole 
um, shoot for ventilation, we're limiting the amount of moisture that we're dumping into that assembly. Yeah, so let's be really clear though, Steve, you are absolutely kicking butt on the continuity of your air control air. Yep. You've got bulk water thoroughly managed. And this is your, okay, as insurance, we want to develop a little bit of airflow to, to relieve whatever moisture makes its way through. And you're probably doing a mechanical system that will keep the loads under control, right? Yes. So, yeah, so the house has a full mechanical ventilation system. So you got all these arrows in your quiver. And the very last one is, well, we're going to we're going to throw some ventilation. And, you know, Steve, this just actually came up yesterday in a home building crossroads that we were doing about, well, wait a minute, does does, you know, moving air dry things out or get them wet? And, yes. you know, if it depends. Yeah, right. Well, if you have control over the air movement, you can yeah. use it to your favor. And if you don't, you better be really careful. And, exactly. you know, Steve and I have done some theatrical fogging to test actual air movement through, you know, soffit to ridge or uh, in any type of space. And there's a, there's quite a bit of, you know, work by uh, venting manufacturers on um, attics and how they vent, but not as much on cathedral assemblies that have a vent chute. Um, yeah. So I bet you, Steve, when we test that one in 12, because um, the code says, yeah, you really shouldn't be venting below a 312. But I bet you we can show that if there's any energy hitting that roof, we're going to get some air movement from, you know, the Load different high. directions that you have venting. And, and the other thing to, to mention, Peter, is it's climate zone four. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huge difference. Yeah. Right. So it's I, not like we're putting this in southern Maine or Minnesota. Yeah. I barely listened to the last three minutes since... Peter said theatrical fogging and the two of you. I just pictured shiny outfits with lots of hand flourishes and batons and things like that. And a small audience in black I prefer, clapping. I prefer more of an Elvis kind of get up. Okay. You know, the big yeah. V cut on the chest, the bell bottoms, you know, flailing as I walk across stage. Well, and of course, I'm wearing my wingnut safety hat Yeah. when we do this because, hey, hey, one thing is... Um, if you're going to do any theatrical fogging, but particularly testing roof venting systems, make sure you call the neighbors and the local fire department. That's very smart. Does this, does this I, I don't, recommendation I won't say any more have... About... <laughs> okay, I was going to say, does this have a story behind it? <laughs> hey, you know, I was doing some fogging at my house recently, and um, I did call the fire department. I got Captain Emery, who's the head of the fire department, and explained what I was doing. And he said, you're using theatrical fog to do what again? And um, I said, well, you're familiar with theatrical foggers. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm very familiar with them. Because they use theatrical fogger, they fill houses with theatrical fog to, to act train. like smoke during trainings. So, And I thought, oh, okay. So he said, yeah, thanks for calling because I know we'll get calls that we can ignore. And he said, but please call back when you're done fogging. <laughs> so, like, there's not a note here. Ignore all smoke oh, coming from, from Peter's from house on. is burning down in the fire. <laughs> the fire chief's like, ah, he's just, it's theatrical fog. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right. So, but it was cool because, you know, firefighters, you know, when you call, they'll know what you're talking about because they use it for training. All right. So, my one surprise topic for today that we didn't discuss at all. Uh, is one of my favorite conversations to have with employees because I've had every employee that we've talked about vapor control and air tightness challenge me on this by saying, well, how the heck can it be vapor open but air tight? Oh. That doesn't make any damn sense. Yeah. And I, I always use drywall as the example that, that drywall is porous, things can diffuse through it without actual air moving through it uh is there a, is there a better example that you guys have for something of that sort is there a better explanation well what's really cool about that is that when they set the air tightness for the astm standard i think it's e2357 of course it is. the the standard for how tight an air uh, how tight a building material in terms of airflow is a half inch of drywall that that's what is 
0.2 liters per square meter. Um, I guess it's, I forget the per second. Um, at if Peter doesn't come pounds. up with this, we'll never know. <laughs> we're not, we're not well, it look doesn't it up. exist. Um, if Peter so, doesn't come up with it, it so doesn't Here's exist. what's really cool about that is that um, air is made up of, you know, nitrogen N2 molecules and oxygen molecules. And um, that's about 80% of the content of air. And they're big compared to water, right? So water molecules are H2O. Well, that's just one oxygen, not two. And the hydrogens are really tiny. They're only have an atomic mass of one. So literally, the water molecules in the vapor form can't get through the spaces in the half inch of drywall as, uh, I'm sorry, the, the water Backwards. molecules can yep. get through because they're tiny in comparison to the, the big ass diatomic nitrogen and oxygen. Um, and so like air like molecules are really fat and the water molecules are really skinny and greased. Uh, I don't know how to argue with that. Interpret what he's... <laughs> yeah. I just have this picture of skinny little water molecules and the oxygen and nitrogen going on diets to try to become... Listen, I, I have a, a, a certified ASTM test for air air leakage. When people say, you know, people say, oh, you can't use concrete as an air barrier. Okay, go up there, put your lips on the wall, blow through it. Prove it to me. <laughs> My wife came downstairs one day in the basement, and I had a smoke stick on one side of a concrete block, and on the other side I had a shop vac. And she just kind of walked by like, well, you're not at a bar, and I'm pretty sure you don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> but I was trying to actually suck the smoke through the concrete block because turns out that while concrete acts as an air barrier, you can't count um, concrete it's block. Yeah. It's too porous. You actually can pull um, some smoke through that. So, um, yeah. But did you measure and calibrate my shop vacuum. back and the smoke shop stick? Back. Now the wing nuts, we don't calibrate shit. We just what uh, what what test <laughs> pressure is that conducted at? Well, we we have a couple minutes. Let's talk about smart vapor barriers because they're or smart vapor retarders. Sorry, see Jake, you started yeah. talking about it Sorry. as a barrier. Now I you, Sorry. you got me speaking the wrong lingo. Now Jay, you have gonna, to stop. Talking I know about barriers. you're such Get a bad it. influence yeah. that the people that highly respect me now are gonna just. Let's remind our audience of that distinction again, though, real quick. We're trying, <laughs> I'm trying very hard to not use the word barrier because none of what we're doing is an actual barrier. Some amount of thermal will get through your thermal barrier, so it should be called a control layer. We're trying to control it as best we can, or we're trying to control the vapor. And so that's an important distinction that they're beating me up over because I have a long-standing habit of using the word barrier instead of control layer. But it's they're right. It's sort of like you can't stop Steve Basic. You just have to control Steve Basic. There you Good go. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Back to smart vapor control layers. Ooh. Hit it, so Steve. Pe no, you hit it, Peter. Come on. Tell me what you know about smart vapor retarders. Well, we're looking What makes for them smart? Yeah. Well, we're looking for materials that change how vapor moves through them with their own vapor or moisture content. So what that means is huh? if there's more moisture inside the, the actual material, they open up. And turns out that a lot of porous materials, when there's more moisture inside them, that's what happens, they do, va they, they do, they do open up. Um, so smart vapor retarders are ones that close down and restrict vapor flow when they're dry and when they have more moisture content, they open up, which means if the assemblies dry, they restrict the flow of moisture, which may be a good thing in climates five and up. And uh, if they get wet, they open. So hence the term smart vapor retarder. And you'd like them to vary from somewhere around one perm, which is the boundary between class two and three, and then move up to greater than 10 to vapor open. So it's not just a change, it's the two 
the two boundaries sort of for when they're dry and when they're wet. And I think some of them open up even far beyond that, like 10 number. I think some of them are in the 20s or 20 plus, aren't they? Yeah, I I, I was hoping you wouldn't ask for actual numbers. I I, yeah. I know that the craft face paper, you know, one of the original smart vapor retarders, it, they didn't pick it for that, but it does move from around one perm up to um, a, I think a bit greater than 10, but that was not an intentional design. The smart vapor retarders of today all have been formulated to make sure that they're as far above 10 as possible. I don't know if they're in the 20s, Steve, but maybe. All right. Well, you keep chatting. I'm going to find out. So that's, that's pretty interesting from a, like, other thing things in my assembly i don't think of them as working like that like changing their properties over time it seems uh like some sort of magical operation but it's just actually pretty basic science yeah and if they're if they're not porous so they're not open uh cell um then they're less likely so the things that are common examples that don't change are six mil poly you know it doesn't matter how much uh, moisture is around or in them they just stay at 0.06 perms um, and then if you look at something like extruded polystyrene which is a, a, a foam a rigid foam um, it's almost entirely closed cell well not porous and so it, it it's change in vapor permeability is negligible um, compared to materials that are real porous and you know this is you know anything with fibers uh wood osb plywood they all have variable vapor permeabilities so well let's talk about all those things i wanted to uh i wanted to surprise you again with a with a test here peter i'm going to give you uh a wall assembly oh. and i'm going to give you the perm ratings of each part of the wall assembly oh, and i man. want you to just ballpark what you think the perm rating is and how you come to that conclusion are you ready? Seriously? Holy yeah. Fuck. Okay, hit me. Uh, so we'll just work from inside to out. We have laser. Hey, I'll planes. just sit here and do nothing. You guys have fun. Okay. okay? Well, <laughs> we figured you were lost in the internet looking for perm ratings of <laughs> smart smart vapor retarders. Uh, so I'm going to put two layers of latex paint. And we're going to assume that that's about five perms. I'm going to put a layer of drywall. Mr. Gypsum, do you remember what the perm rating is of half in, half inch gypsum? Forty perms. Okay. Uh, we're going to go mineral wool bat in a, a two by six cavity. Yep. I don't know what oh. that actual is, but um, let, let's come back to that. <laughs> uh, OSB. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just go with a uh, five perm house wrap. We won't put a name to, to who makes it. And then after that, we'll go, uh, since we're using OSB and house wrap, let's assume vinyl siding. Okay. And uh, I'm not going to give you a perm rating for the vinyl siding. So 300. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what's okay. our, what's our so, prediction here? So let's back up. The latex paint, that's about 15 perms per coat. And um, we, we might have to come back to the fact, well, how then do you calculate for two coats? Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think two coats of latex with a standard latex primer that does get you into three to five perms category and if we're going to do the vapor profile that we do this by category that would be a class three retarder the gypsum wallboard is 40 perms that's vapor open i don't know what the mineral uh bat is but it's way vapor open compared best, best i could find was in the 100s range yeah yeah, that makes perfect higher. sense because it's so air open and yeah. then therefore also vapor open. I'd assume the same thing from fiberglass too. Yeah. If yeah. we're unfaced, obviously. And then OSB. O o OSB gets treated as a generic project, but there's act yeah. product, but there's actually significant differences among different OSBs. But generally they're in the the two to say eight perms with the the test when they are dry being in the two perm range and then 
what happens as you move up to really wet, that's pretty variable for different types. But I would say that's a class three retarder. Um, and then the five perm WRB, that's a class three retarder. Many house reps, if they're, um, you know, the synthetic uh, spun bonded polyolefin, they're already above 10 perms, they're vapor open. And the cool thing about vinyl siding is that, um, you know, vinyl, which is a plastic, is non-porous and has no pores. It has a very low vapor permeability, but there's so much air circulating around vinyl siding, its equivalent vapor permeability is about 60 perms. And the code actually treats vinyl siding as a vented rain screen. Um, and so not only do you get significant air movement, which means you're pretty vapor open, you actually get some free drainage with that vinyl siding. So I would say that that assembly from the O, so we're gonna pick the OSB as about the least, the least yeah. vapor permeable, but from that layer, it can readily dry to the interior and from that layer, it can readily dry to the exterior. So bang on. Steve, are you awake? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys done? <laughs> So we're so we're basically saying that uh, it, it doesn't matter from that point from a like what is the what is the perm rating? I mean, we can assume that the perm rating of that wall is whatever the lowest point in that wall is that that OSB layer probably, uh, and that we have drying potential in both directions. And I think we would all admit that that also that wall doesn't work everywhere. We're not we're not making any claims or anything right. like that we're just using an example of the complexity of the vapor profile of your wall if we're really going to nerd out and and just to do to really nerd out um uh, perm is a flow not a resistance to flow so when we try to calculate the total energy flow we can't use the u values which is heat flow we have to take the reciprocals which is the resistance to flow, add those together, and then flip it back again to get the total flow. Uh, PERMS is exactly the same. Since PERMS is a flow, if we want to try to add up, like what's the total moisture flow through that assembly from one side to the other, we take the PERM ratings of each layer, flip them to get to the resistance to PERM, add those together, then flip it back. Um, to me, that's one of the coolest things about heat and moisture is that the way we think about their movement is exactly the same. Resistance compared to flow and the fact that they're a reciprocal relationship. That is now, a nice little bow. Now we need to really... I was just going to say that, you know, you said the coolest thing. The coolest thing to me is, is having a buddy like you that thinks it's so cool to dive that deep into heat and moisture. Yeah, well, I'm a pretty lonely guy. There's very few people that think the way that you do, Steve. It is Brattleboro. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here's a good, if we're ready to wrap up. Yeah. Um, oh, I got all day. When we talk about vapor, we have three threats and three tools. How you design your building enclosure how you integrate your mechanical systems and then how you educate your occupants about their contribution to moisture management. Great. Right, Steve? So you got to say design and execute, right? Oh, absolutely. Design is Steve, execute is Jake. And what well, I mean by that is Jake wants to execute Steve. To, there you go. To elaborate on Mostly. that, Peter, what I, what I think is interesting is as we progress into the future of energy efficiency and such we're building or we're required to build wall assemblies that are less forgiving mm. right here here so if, if you built a two by four wall you could pretty much screw it up there's still enough energy moving through that wall to probably save you because it's not thick but you build a two by eight wall or a double 12 inch wall that surface out there is not, the surface meaning the inside face of the sheathing, is not seeing a whole lot of energy. Yeah. There's not much for saving grace out there. So 
again, it's it's not that vapor diffusion scares me, but you need to understand what you're doing and pay attention. In that we're 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 getting things more complicated. Things aren't simplifying. Yeah, I like to think of it as if we're going to ask more of our buildings, we better be asking more of ourselves as building professionals. Well, I can't even come back that's with nothing on that. That's, that's my good one. that's my son of a Lutheran but, minister. But we got to <laughs> let that be the end. Okay, so I want to say thank you guys for joining me this time. Uh, I also want to announce to our listeners, number one, if you would like to ask questions, I have a feeling we'll have an episode where we just answer questions coming up. Uh, Feel free to email us at questions at the unbuildedpodcast.com. Sorry, questions at unbuildedpodcast.com. Uh, you can reach out to us with your questions on Instagram. It's Unbuild It Podcast on Instagram. You can follow Steve at Stephen Basic Architects on Instagram. You can find Peter somewhere on Instagram. And I like saying it like that to see if he knows what his Instagram handle is each and every time. I only know because Steve told me so many times, building right Peter with a W. Okay. And that right, for those of you that don't live near the coast, is a shipwright reference, correct? Absolutely. Thanks, Jake. Uh, And then I want to say that this is our uh, last call for sticker requests uh, this year. We're going to put stickers on hold after, uh, say, somewhere in the early November range because we have something else exciting coming up that we haven't haven't announced yet. So if you want uh, cool stickers... My office manager is getting tired of mailing out stickers and having to figure out how to write addresses in different parts of the world. Uh, and so uh, we'll put those on hold starting mid-November. So you got to go on Instagram or email us through the uh, questions. Hey, did you see my IG post? I just drove up the coast and saw like three or four of the stickers <laughs> in crazy locations. Yeah, I have a feeling that they weren't just discovered, but we won't. We won't throw you under the bus with any municipalities who are cleaning off stickers off of statues this week. And I just want to point out that the Unbuild It podcast stickers are a class one vapor retarder, so be careful where you put them. (laughs) So get your sticker request in quickly. And uh, uh, we wanted to say thank you guys for listening, and I want to say have a fantastic day, and don't worry about vapor as much as you thought you should. Always a pleasure, you guys. Thanks, gentlemen. I wanted to add a couple uh, housekeeping items to the end of this podcast. Number one, September 16th, 2020. Steve Basic and I will be uh, conducting a one-day seminar in Kansas City, Missouri with the Kansas City BS and Beer Group. It's called the Midwest Building Science Symposium. It is a live event. Uh, We will be social distancing and wearing masks, but it is also a free event. Uh, and I believe that that's including uh, Boulevard Breweries uh, beer as well. So it should be a great day of building science, talking about control layers, constructability, durable design, all around good information sharing. Uh, go to KC or bsandbeerkc.org to sign up for that event. I would also like to point out, if you would like to get a hold of us, if you would like to ask a question, you can email the three of us, uh, questions at unbuilditpodcast.com, or direct message us through our Instagram account. And if you contact us through either one of those avenues, and you also provide us with your address, and you say, I would like one of those cool Unbuild It Podcast stickers, we will mail you a handful of stickers. We're trying to spread the word about this podcast and our... Uh, Our idea here is podcasts aren't spread through paid advertising campaigns. They are spread through word of mouth because people care about the content. And so we want you to share a sticker, uh, share the podcast with a friend, share it on Instagram, help us spread the word, spread the word and continue to grow the podcast. So until next time questions midwest symposium on building science and stickers if you want them thanks for listening